The last name is Barr. Right. Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. 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 Okay, we'll get started. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, good to see folks. And uh, I, I have the pleasure of introducing our uh, speaker today, Laura Ferreze, uh, uh, who uh, we were saying is out for her first uh, live talk uh, since pandemic. So excited that she is able to come back to Caltech. Uh, this is our annual uh, Bard lecture. Uh, so I just wanna say a couple words about uh, who this uh, lecture is named for, uh, and then introduce our speaker. So uh, this is the, the R. Jack and uh, Forrest Lindbard lecture in, astro in astrophysics. This was endowed by uh, Captain Forrest Texbard and his sister Aubrey Trigg in memory of their parents. Uh, and uh, uh, Texbard, uh, who uh, led the endowment of this lecture, uh, first of all, it's pronounced Bard, not fired, or uh, however you might read it. I uh, uh, was born in 1912 in Texas uh, and passed away in 2009. Uh, and he uh, spent much of his career in the Navy uh, with a number of highlights that, uh, simply for the sake of time, I don't have uh, the ability to go through in detail, still put together a sort of detailed uh, biography and slides that I just have to skip through very quickly. Uh, after going to the Naval Academy, he uh, served uh, in the Pacific Theater uh, in World War II, uh, was stationed at Pearl Harbor, and worked on a team of uh, Navy, Navy cryptographers uh, and codebreakers uh, who were involved in major naval intelligence operations, tracking uh, Japanese naval codes, uh, which were critical to, to various allied uh, uh, successes in uh, major battles in the Pacific Theater. Um, he then uh, returned to Japan after the war uh, and spent some time there before returning to the U.S. Uh, and completing postgraduate study at Annapolis and at Ohio State in nuclear engineering and nuclear physics. Um, uh, he worked uh, on early testing for uh, uh, the H-bomb and then uh, uh, received a master's in physics from Ohio State before retiring uh, from the Navy. Uh, these are some of the uh, some pictures of uh, uh, Pearl Harbor and the USS Yorktown, uh, where uh, some of his naval intelligence work played major roles in uh, uh, major battles in the Pacific Theater. Uh, but after retiring from the Navy from 1955 through 1985, he was a physics professor at Long Beach City College, where he developed courses uh, on acoustics and physics of music, uh, which were then shown on TV and broadcast on radio. Uh, this wouldn't have been one of his uh, shows, but Sterl found it as an uh, uh, early example of, you know, uh, remote learning and just, uh, you know, before we had Zoom, we still found ways to do these things over radio and television. Uh, and uh, the uh, origin of this particular lecture series comes from largely a sabbatical uh, he took at Caltech, where he audited various physics and astrophysics courses and interacted with a number of uh, uh, you know, notable members of the faculty at the time, uh, including Jesse Grease, Simon Richard Feynman, Du Bridge, and others, and uh, basically enjoyed it uh, so much that they felt they wanted to establish uh, this lecture uh, in the, the memory of their family. Uh, so uh, this is the eighth annual uh, Bard lecture. Uh, uh, there's uh, a quite uh, uh, prestigious list of uh, generally uh, honoring it's intended to honor sort of early and mid-career researchers who made exceptional contributions and who have some connection to, to Caltech, uh, which uh, Laura does. So Laura's resume is, is ridiculously impressive, um, and I have to, uh, this is the consolidated version of her, of her CV. Um, uh, but uh, after her undergraduate at uh, Padova, she did her PhD at Johns Hopkins. Uh, and then, of course, most importantly, was a Hubble Fellow at Caltech. Uh, and that's her connection uh, uh, specifically to this lecture series, but, but uh, we're happy to, to have her here. And she's uh, since then uh, had a number of uh, very uh, impressive positions. She was uh, subsequently briefly a, a NASA fellow and then a professor at Rutgers. And since then 
has uh, simultaneously juggled being uh, uh, adjunct, uh, uh, visiting adjunct at Victoria and Padova and uh, primarily working at the, the National Research Council of Canada, uh, which is now a, a principal research officer of the uh, Hertzberg Center. Uh, and she's held a number of very important titles and roles and leadership roles as a vice president of the IAU and president of the uh, Canadian Astronomical Society. Uh, uh, she was the director of Gemini from uh, 2017 to 2018, uh, head of various uh, boards and uh, far more committees, I'm sure, than you would have wanted to be the head of, but, uh, and also has been honored with quite a large number of prizes, a few of which are, are listed here, uh, uh, recently uh, uh, inducted as a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Um, and scientifically, uh, that recognizes the, the breadth of very important accomplishments, and I won't spend long on this because we're going to hear Laura describe uh, her work in her own words, but she's worked on an enormous variety of topics, especially in galaxy and extragalactic uh, structure and evolution. Um, perhaps the thing, even if you uh, don't work in this field, that you've no doubt run across or at least heard mentioned is uh, the M sigma relation and Faraday and Merritt uh, is uh, the seminal paper that has a, a ludicrous number of citations. I looked it up as of this morning across 3,600, I think. so. Uh, uh, discovering this correlation between black hole uh, properties and uh, velocity dispersion of host galaxies, but Laura actually wrote quite a number of papers uh, understanding how black holes interrelate to galaxy properties, halo properties, star cluster properties. She's also worked on AGN with reverberation mapping uh, and other techniques looking at the properties of fueling supermassive black holes, their connection to nuclear star clusters and galactic nuclei. Uh, cusps and cores and what that tells us about the internal structure of galaxies, going out to sort of galaxy scale dynamics, kinematics, what that tells us about how galaxies formed and how they got to uh, their state today, alongside what the stars themselves tell us in the form of stellar populations, star clusters, etc. Uh, along the way, she's also played a major role in things like uh, the HST Key Project and uh, worked with Wendy Friedman and others on uh, calibrating uh, the Cepheid distance ladder for measurements of the Hubble constant, um, and sort of a broad range of, of understanding galaxies from the tiniest dwarf galaxies uh, in sort of the local neighborhood through massive galaxy clusters like Virgo. Um, uh, you know, again, I could list many different things here, uh, but uh, I'll stop and let uh, Laura tell us more uh, in her words uh, about what she's working on now. So I'm just going to switch over to your presentation uh, and thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Phil. Um, I have never been introduced to this live so before, so <laughs> I'm afraid you're going to be disappointed after all that. But so um, I will let you know this is my first trip uh, in two and a half years and uh, I will not risk getting COVID for just anyone. Um, I, I had a, a terrific time when I was here as a postdoc and now over 20 years ago. And then I really think I owe a lot of my career to those three years I spent in, uh, in Robinson. So very, very fun memory. And I really want to thank each and single one of you for this invitation. It's, it really is a pleasure to be back. Um, so galaxies at the extreme, um, I, I am going to show you some results from a CFHT uh, survey that we have conducted recently. So this is a very quick outline of the talk. Um, I will walk you through the scientific motivation that led us to the survey. I will talk a little bit about the survey design. Is there a... Um, a, a point? It, it doesn't matter if there is one, I'll just point. And, uh, and then I will I will focus um, in, in, you know on, on, on specific examples so on, on galaxies on baryonic structures that don't quite seem to fit our picture of uh, the way that uh, galaxies should look like so in particular I will talk about ultra diffuse galaxies a little bit not very much about compact ellipticals and then ultra compact doors and I will end with a, with a couple of slides on what what the future has in store for this field. So um, I would like to start by giving you a bit of a flavor of the scientific thinking that motivated uh, um, our survey. And of course, understanding the formation and evolution of galaxies is a very active field of research to which a tremendous amount of effort has been devoted, both on the observational and the uh, theoretical side. And observationally, 
uh, these efforts range from the study of the hierarchy universe to galactic archaeology. But in the local universe, one of the best diagnostics that we have to constrain the process that shape a galaxy evolution is to study the relations that link the structural, dynamical, and stellar population properties of uh, galaxies. And of course, one of the most celebrated of such relation is the fundamental plane of the early type galaxy. And this is the plot that started it all from uh, Joe Davis back in 1987. And a tremendous amount has been inferred from this relation and, and a lot of effort has gone into trying to, uh, to, to reproduce the tilt and the shape of the fundamental plane. And this is from a, a, an old analysis paper by, by Phil and, and his collaborator showing that the observed fundamental plane at the bottom and at the top that the result of simulations that um, uh, reproduce the tilt in the plane according to the amount of dissipation during galaxy assembly as a function of mass. The fundamental plane is, of course, not the only scaling relation that we have. There's, there's a whole variety of them that not just relate to the large scale properties of galaxies, but also those properties to the properties of the very innermost regions, the supermassive black holes, so the stellar nuclei. And without going into details, the point that I'm trying to drive across is that um, uh, detailed studies of nearby galaxies and the relations that they obey can really inform uh, hydrodynamical cosmological simulations as to the details of the processes that um, contribute to the evolution of galaxies. And these go from you know, the morphological transformation of these galaxies that results from high speed encounters um, uh, within galaxies and, and within a galaxy, uh, a cluster tidal field to the stripping of gas as uh, galaxies sweep through the intergalactic uh, or intercluster medium uh, within a cluster environment. And I, I always feel that, that we are sort of living in the golden age for these kind of studies, because not only observationally, we've made tremendous strides forward, but also from the simulation side, we now are at the stage where we actually have uh, uh, simulated galaxies that you would be hard pressed to distinguish from real galaxies. And this is from uh, the Illustris PNG 100 simulations showing uh, a, an array of star forming galaxies on the left and the quiescent galaxies on the right. And again, you, you would not be able to, to tell really that these are not uh, real galaxies. Now, um, the, one of the corollaries of the fact that, that galaxies are surprisingly well behaved and really follow these sometimes very tight scaling relations is that anything deviates from those scaling relations is immediately pointed at as perhaps having, um, having followed an unusual formation or evolutionary um, uh, channel. And I will give you a particular example of this. Uh, so this is a figure from Carmody and collaborators a few years back. Um, so this is uh, magnitude on the x-axis versus size, so that's effective radius on the y-axis. And uh, um, these are all early type galaxies. Uh, so you can see here the sequence of giant elliptical galaxies. And that sequence, the colors also help, but that sequence really seems to be disjoint from the sequence as defined by the green points. Um, those are dwarf ellipticals. So two very separate sequences. And the interpretation in this particular paper is that because these sequences are disjoint, um, these two classes of galaxies, giant ellipticals or dwarf ellipticals, have, for, uh, have followed uh, completely different uh, formation and evolutionary tracks. So they just have nothing to do with each other. Uh, moreover, on the low mass or low luminosity scale of the giant ellipticals, you find the compact ellipticals. These are galaxies like M32. In fact, one of those is M32. These seem to follow the same relations as the giant ellipticals. So, so in this interpretation, M32 is nothing but the shrunk down analog, analog of a giant elliptical galaxy like M87, let's say. Now, this, this plot was made by compiling heterogeneous data from the literature. And this is the same plot, but this time, every dot here really samples the luminosity function in a single environment, which happens to be the Virgo cluster. And now you have a different, a different view. Now, what you see is a single sequence that connects the giant ellipticals all the way down to, um, to the dwarf ellipticals, and these are actually local group dwarfs. 
it's not a linear relation, so it's certainly not a homologous relation, but it's a continuous relation that could be interpreted as a continuous transition among the processes that, that contributed to the evolution of galaxies that from the low luminosity end all the way to the high luminosity end. And in this view, it's the compact ellipticals that are different. So no matter you know, what your views on the subject um, are, the point to drive across here is that um, to know what doesn't fit, you first need to define what's normal. And to be able to define what is normal, it's really important to be able to um, really characterize biases and systematics in your data set. Um, the other point I want to make is that uh, to understand galaxy evolution, you really need to study bionic structures on all scales. An obvious example, um, if you want to study giant elliptical galaxies or giant galaxies in general, you better understand dwarf galaxies because those are the building blocks that lead to the formation of the more massive systems. Likewise, this is an image of MEP7, um, the galaxy, the dominant galaxy in the, in the Virgo cluster. And this is the same galaxy that now, um, sorry, it's the same field, but the, a model of the galaxy has been subtracted. So each little dot that you might see uh, in there is not noise. Uh, each little dot is a globular cluster that belongs to the uh, very uh, numerous globular cluster system in MEP7. Historically, global clusters have been used to reconstruct the formation history of the galaxies to which they belong. And for instance, this is from a recent paper by uh, Christensen and collaborators, where they used the, uh, the age metallicity distribution for about 100 global clusters in our own Milky Way to reconstruct the merger tree of the Milky Way. And, and uh, those tracks that go vertical, those are uh, satellites of the Milky Way that are incorporated within the larger structure. The last one is Sagittarius, for instance. So again, to, to, to understand the formation of, uh, uh, of, of a structure in general, the properties of global cluster system are an incredible powerful uh, diagnostic. So objects cannot be studied in isolation. Uh, so you really have to have a complete view of baryonic structure from the central nuclei all the way the luminosity function and to the global clusters to have a, uh, an unbiased uh, data set that can really inform your, uh, your understanding of galaxy evolution. And then the last point I want to make is that um, the diagnostic power of galaxy scaling relations is really amplified by the study of the low surface brightness universe. That, that is a very old simulation now, but I like it because it shows the uh, assembly of a massive galaxy and each building block is color coded differently. So you can really see where all the different fragments are coming from. The picture at the bottom, that, that's a real galaxy, that's a, a NGC 474, um, it's a galaxy of about 30 megaparsecs, it's a very famous picture. Um, and you can see the, the extended uh, um, uh, system of shells and filaments that, that are, of course, the result of the very violent history of, of merging that this galaxy has undergone. So studying low surface brightness features can really inform your models for the formation of galaxies. And this is not just on galaxy scale, but it's also on cluster scale. And many of you will have seen this image from uh, Chris Mills, which shows the diffuse light in uh, the Virgo cluster. Uh, so that, that image is about, I think, 600 kiloparsecs on, on the side also. And again, you see this very extended um, filamentary structure that is the result of the uh, uh, interactions uh, of galaxies within, in this case, the core of Virgo. Okay, so um, uh, given all of this, in our attempts to contribute to uh, this field, we really wanted to design a survey that would allow us to survey all of these different uh, diagnostics. So from the large scale structure at very low surface brightness level so that we can compare the observations. This is the same image I just showed you with simulations that now are capable of reproducing some of this structure. We wanted to, with the same survey, study the uh, galaxy population so that we can compare galaxy across the entire luminosity function with the uh, prediction of cosmological hydrodynamical simulations. And also we wanted to have a survey that has enough spatial resolution to really uh, uh, study the fine structure. So the core of galaxies, the stellar nuclei, the globular cluster systems. 
So once we decided all of that, the only thing we need to decide is where to look. And, and there the, the choice was very clear uh, to us at least. Um, uh, and that was the Virgo cluster. The Virgo cluster is, is the dominant mass concentration in the local universe. It's the largest collection of galaxies uh, within 35 megaparsecs. It's the main component of the local supercluster. This is in supergalactic coordinates, the Milky Way is right at the center. The Virgo cluster is where the arrow points. Um, and and the, the local group itself is actually caught in a, a, a stream towards the, the Virgo cluster itself. So the survey started over uh, a decade ago at the time Megacam at CFHT was really the only game in town. Megacam is a one square degree uh, imager. The Virgo cluster from its core uh, to one meter radius spans a, a spatial extent of about 100 square degrees. So it's a very large area of the sky. Um, that the gray contours there, that's an uh, X-ray map of Virgo, and the two circles, Virgo is now relaxed, so that shows the outline of our survey, and each megacam pointing is shown by the red, um, the red squares. So we covered the cluster uh, with imaging in uh, uh, U, G, I, and Z. We have partial coverage in the R band and the K band, but not for the entire field. Uh, most importantly, the data are very deep. So we have a 10 sigma point source detection limit of 25.7. So for an old stellar population, this is about four, ten times, ten to, to, sorry, four times 10 to the four solar masses. Uh, it's about two magnitudes uh, fainter than the turnover of the global cluster luminosity function. And we really began the systematic, so we have, we, we go very deep in surface brightness as well, about 29 magnitudes per arc second square. So this is about 0.1 um, solar mass per parser square uh, for, for an older stellar population. Just in, for those of you who like physical <laughs> scales, um, that, that whole image is about um, 3.2 this way by 3.8 uh, megaparsecs or so. Uh, we also have extensive spectroscopic follow-ups for many of the objects in the field, mostly the globular clusters and the hill stars. And at this point, um, the, the main headache was really to use this survey to identify the uh, uh, Virgo members within the clusters. Um, and I'll, I'll show you one particular example. You're just looking at the uh, core of Virgo now. So this is a two by two uh, degree field. So again, about 600 kiloparsecs um, or so, a little bit less. Um, M87 is the larger galaxy at the center. There's about 180 galaxies that are cataloged in uh, this region. We think we really have a very robust way of identifying Virgo members, even in the absence of spectroscopic uh, confirmation. And based on that uh, procedure, we identify 230 additional galaxies within this field. And this is just uh, to show what one of those galaxies look like. Obviously, they're very faint. Uh, they're very low surface brightness compared to the objects that were already uh, known. So this is the core of Virgo. And uh, this is now the entire 100 uh, square degree uh, field. Um, this is a, uh, a plot showing all the galaxies that were known before our survey. And these are the new galaxies. Um, that we detected based on the survey. So we go down to a limit of about a few times, so several times 10 to the four solar masses. We are complete at several times 10 to the five solar masses. For comparison, the STSS or uh, the VCC, the limit is about 10 to the six solar masses. So we are complete below the level at which STSS stops seeing things essentially. So that's just a comparison between um, before and after. And I couldn't, I couldn't help not showing this image. Um, this was actually done by taking all of models of all those galaxies, about 3,600 of them, and just reconstructing Virgo uh, with no background or foreground contaminants. So those of you who like simulations, that's what Virgo really looks like if you, if you just exclude everything else that's not in it. OK, so back to uh, scaling relations. These are a number of uh, uh, structural scaling relations. So on the vertical axis, it's luminosity or uh, absolute magnitude on the left and mass on the right. 
And uh, these are a number of um, structural parameters, the surface index, uh, the central surface brightness, and then the surface brightness at the effective radius and averaged within an effective radius and then the effective radius at the end. These are VCC galaxies that were known before our survey. If you want to push um, uh, further than this, uh, then you really only, you could only look in the local group essentially. So these are local group uh, um, dwarf spheroidal uh, galaxies. And these are um, the 3,600 galaxies that uh, we detect uh, based on our survey. So it's a factor of uh, uh, several million, almost 6 million in, uh, in uh, luminosity. Okay, so armed with that, I think we can now look at what, at what does not fit uh, within uh, these scaling relations. So what I'd like to discuss are ultra-diffuse galaxies. So we see the plot showing luminosity versus average surface brightness. Uh, that's the main galaxy sequence. Uh, so anything on this side is larger and more diffuse than galaxies belonging to the main uh, ridge line. Uh, on the opposite side, we have compact ellipticals. So again, these are galaxies that are more compact compared to galaxies of the same mass or luminosity along the ridge line. And then at the extreme of that, we have ultra compact dwarf galaxies that basically bridge the, 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 the gap. Uh, they don't fill the gap, but bridge the gap between the compact ellipticals and the parabola clusters, which are on the lower uh, right. And this is just to show you, to give you an idea of what these galaxies look like. Um, that's M31. The galaxy at the top is NGC 205. That's a classical uh, dwarf galaxy. Uh, at the bottom, that's M32. It's about the same magnitude as NGC 205, but clearly a lot more compact. Um, that's on top an ultra compact dwarf galaxy. And then at the opposite extreme, this is an ultra diffuse uh, galaxy. And these are all on the same physical scale, just to give you an idea of the diversity of uh, parameters that we, we, uh, we sample for these galaxies. Okay, so let me start with the uh, ultra diffuse galaxies. And UDGs have really received a lot of attention following the discovery of a few dozen uh, such, uh, such objects in uh, the Virgo, uh, sorry, in the comma cluster. It's the same plot I just showed you. And uh, th this is uh, an image from uh, Peter Van Dockman collaborators who really brought this to the general attention. Uh, that's actually an HST image of that particular galaxy in Poma. Uh, there isn't really a, a, a clear definition for these objects. So basically, anything that's large, larger than 1.5 kiloparsecs, uh, and, and that has low optical surface brightness, fainter than, let's say, 25 meters per second square in the G band at the effective radius, is a bona fide member of uh, the class. Nothing magical with these numbers. And in fact, 1.5 kiloparsec, that's the resolution of the dragonfly array um, at the distance of Thomas. So, so certainly nothing physical about it. Um, as I said, they were first uh, found in large number in the comma cluster. They're now known to existing groups as well as in the field. Now, the main reason why these objects have been the focus of, of so much uh, interest is that, at least in a cluster environment, it's difficult to understand how something so diluted and so diffuse can survive uh, the cluster tides. And the, the, the first thing that comes to mind is, of course, that they might be enveloped in very massive dark matter cocoons that really uh, shield them from the tidal uh, field of the cluster itself. And indeed, the very first few investigations um, that tried to look at the mass to light ratio for these objects found the very elevated mass to light ratios. The mass to light ratio within the half uh, light radius is shown on the vertical axis against the mass within that radius on the horizontal axis. So the gray uh, points here, that U shape, um, this is, these are baryonic structures from galaxy clusters at the more massive end down to regular galaxy and then up to a dwarf galaxy. In fact, those are local group dwarf galaxies. The two UDGs that were targeted, one in Virgo and one in Coma, both had elevated mass to light ratio. So both are dark matter dominated. However, the, the picture is really more complicated than this. And in fact, uh, there are now uh, a number of galaxies that really seem to have no dark matter at all. So this is the ratio between bionic and dynamical mass versus dynamical mass. Um, 
those two um, pentagons, I guess, uh, so DF2 and then the cross up there, DF4, these are older, uh, so, so let's say red uh, UVGs associated with the 1052 group, they both seem to be completely devoid of uh, dark matter. Now, that, that result was really disputed when it came out a few years ago, but it really stood the test of time, and, and it really looks like the amount of dark matter in these objects is really low. If you look at UDGs in the field, uh, these are generally quite gas rich, so you can do H1 interferometric observations and uh, those uh, uh, data points are shown by the stars. Those also seem to have essentially no dark matter content, they're, they're entirely consistent with the invariant uh, dominated. So it, it's, it, it's not a uniform class. Um, in the property of their dark matter, but also in many other ways, including, uh, for instance, the property of their globular cluster systems. As a result, there's a number of scenarios that have been proposed for the formation of these galaxies. And uh, the, the very first one proposed by Van Dockum uh, with the comma survey was, these might be simply failed L-star galaxies that uh, where, where gas was basically lost before it could uh, form stars, and therefore you, you're left with a normal uh, dark matter halo, but very little uh, bionic content. Um, other scenarios contend that these uh, just correspond to the um, high spin tail of the galaxy angular momentum distribution. Uh, they could be dwarfs that have undergone episodes of expansion and contractions due to uh, sudden outflows of gas uh, as a result of uh, episodes of active star formation. Um, and uh, so, so these are sort of internal scenario, but there's also external uh, scenario for the formation of these galaxies. And in particular, uh, one of the main contenders is that these galaxies are objects that have been transformed as a consequence of the mean tidal field of uh, the cluster. And indeed, that there are simulations of tidal stripping of galaxies embedded in extended dark matter halos that show that uh, this process can indeed lead to remnants of much lower surface brightness than their uh, progenitors that look very much like the UDGs that we say. The point is that um, I think there's been tremendous uh, progress in this field, but the many questions that surround these objects, which include even the appropriateness of the claim that they make up a completely distinct class of objects, um, so these, these questions stem in large part from the fact that, that we do not have a complete and homogeneous data set uh, to study uh, these structures. Uh, for instance, this is a figure from CODA and collaborators in the comma cluster. The UDGs are the crosses, um, the normal galaxies are the, the uh, circles. That gap is not physical. Uh, it, it's, it's just that they did not sample that region and they're very uh, upfront about this in the paper, but then it's difficult to correlate one sample to the other when you're missing a whole bunch of things in between. So with the NGVS, we have um, a, a very deep wide field images that is sensitive both to the low surface brightness end of the galaxy population and to the normal rise and really fills that gap. So um, these are the same scaling relations I showed earlier. So that's luminosity. Um, this is surface brightness at an average within the effective radius, and that's the effective radius. This is work that was uh, um, uh, carried out by Song Sun Lim for the NGVS collaboration. And uh, our proposal is uh, to select a UDG sample as anything that deviates by more than two and a half, uh, so 2.5 sigma from the main ridge line of these relations. Again, there's nothing magical with 2.5, but you can be less or more conservative. When we choose 2.5, the objects, which are shown here by the red and the blue points, uh, look like UDGs, okay? But in fact, we have now a, uh, we're working on a paper where we relax that to two sigma, and that really reveals some interesting trends as you go from the, the uh, more low surface brightness objects towards the regular, uh, the, the sequence of, of normal galaxies, let's say. Now, the first thing to note here is that if you look at these uh, galaxies, and this is on the right hand side, this is a histogram uh, of the middle plot uh, on the um, um, range main, to, which is spanned by the, um, the uh, UDGs, you see that this is really just the extension of the regular galaxy population. So it's not really uh, in any way a separate family. Let me just open a parenthesis. 
Um, if Virgo is filled with things at 32 magnitudes per hexagon square, we will not see them. Okay, because we're, we're just not sensitive that. But, but what we do sample completely is the transition between the UDGs, whatever you want to call them, and the other galaxies. And that, that really is the important point. Uh, okay, so what do these things look like? Um, well, they look like um, a very mixed class. So we have a very wide range of morphologies. We have objects that are um, very symmetric and undisturbed. We have other objects that are very, um, very irregular. Uh, the second one on the top row, for instance, and many others. We do have some objects that really look like merger remnants. And we have other objects that show tidal uh, 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 streams at the very first one. And I don't know if you can quite see on the screen, but it does show this very tidal, um, this very thin tidal uh, uh, stream. So, so at least some of these UDGs uh, owe their, their evolution to tidal uh, interactions and or to mergers. If you look at where they're distributed uh, within the cluster, they're very centrally concentrated. And in fact, um, a quarter of the sample of UDGs, and they, sorry, Step back. Uh, so the gray is um, the X-ray map for Virgo, and the UDGs are the red and the blue points. The difference between the red and the blue is just the slightly different criterion in the way they are selected. It's a detail; and it's not really terribly important at this stage. But um, so almost a quarter of them are within about four percent of the survey area, and that four percent is corresponds to the, the deepest part of the uh, Virgo gravitational. Uh, potential. And in fact, they are more concentrated than the galaxy population itself. So this is the cumulative distribution uh, of uh, structures as a function of the distance from the galaxy density peak, which is shown by the, I don't know if you can see, but that uh, uh, blue cross, um, the yellow cross, that's M87, but the density peak is slightly offset from M87 itself. So the regular galaxies are shown by the black line, the UDGs are shown by the red and the blue. I think the distinction is uh, uh, almost semantic. Uh, so you can see that the UDGs are indeed more centrally concentrated than uh, the galaxy population itself. So how about the dark matter content? Uh, this is the same plot I showed earlier, and this is from our own investigation, and uh, this is um, uh, led by Elisa Koloba. And as you can, so the, the, the galaxies that Elisa analyzed are shown by the red uh, dots, the other, the, the blue ones are the ones that were previously analyzed by other groups. And again, you can see it uh, just like for the morphology, that there's a, a, a wide range, granted it's sum of three, but there's a wide range in the dark matter context from galaxies uh, that are quite dark matter dominated to some that are, are quite uh, uh, comparable to galaxies of near luminosity. Uh, it's interesting to note, again, based on a sample of three, that the, the bottom galaxy, uh, the one that's shown by a triangle pointing up, um, that is the one of the three that shows a very disturbed morphology. The other two are very, very symmetric. So there, there might be a suggestion that that is due to the lack of a very large uh, dark matter content in that, in that particular galaxy. So we have uh, proceeded to study two of these galaxies in more detail. So now we go from a small sample to an even smaller sample of two. Uh, and those are BCC615 and the LSD, uh, so the, the two with the larger dark matter content. Uh, and this is just to show you where these galaxies are in Virgo. Again, this is the central part of the cluster. You can see M87 at the bottom here. VLSB B uh, is right at the center of, of Virgo uh, potential well, so right in the densest part of the cluster, according to the X-ray distribution, and VCC 615 is a little bit further uh, down. So uh, VCC 615 was uh, analyzed by Chris Mills for the collaboration. Um, so we have HST images of this galaxy which we yeah, did use to measure TRGB distance, uh, which, is, which is very accurate to the galaxy. Uh, so that's, that's the actual HST image. You can see the galaxy is very, uh, very well behaved, very, uh, very undisturbed. So based on the TRGB distance, 
the galaxy is actually on the far side of the cluster. It's about one megaparsec beyond the cluster. The back to front depth of Virgo is about 2.3 megaparsecs or so. This galaxy is also moving away from Virgo at very high velocity, it's about a thousand uh, kilometers per second. So the galaxy is clearly on an outbound uh, trajectory and uh, orbital modeling using the position velocity data for uh, uh, VCC 615 and a model um, for a, a Virgo mass model shows that there's about a 50% chance that this galaxy has um, passed within 600 kiloparsecs of the Virgo core in the last giga year or so. Only few, if a small percentage, I think about 10% of the orbits really have the galaxy going through the very deepest part of the potential well, so within 200 kiloparsecs or so. The other galaxy tells a very similar story, interestingly enough. Uh, so this is uh, um, an investigation led by a graduate student, Yunhao Zhang, and what you now found is that this is now based on the properties of the global cluster system. Uh, uh, VLSDB is on the front side of the cluster, is on the near side of the cluster, about three megaparsecs uh, in front of the cluster, although the uncertainty on that distance is, is much larger than for the TRGB. It's also moving away from uh, the cluster now towards us at about 2,000 kilometers per second. So one is in the background moving away that way, and the other is in the foreground. Um, and again, just for uh, uh, as for uh, the um, VCC 615, um, we find that the majority of the orbits bring this galaxy within 600 kiloparsecs of the cluster core in the past two giga years or so. So it's, it's a very consistent story based on the sample of two. Um, but based on this, Neither one of these galaxies is consistent with being a field uh, UDG that is in falling towards the cluster. Both have gone to a pericenter passage, at, at least one pericenter passage quite recently. And both have very undisturbed morphologies, which will lead us to believe that they are indeed within a, very, a fairly massive dark matter halo that can protect them from tides. So the, the whole scenario is quite consistent with uh, these simulations that were recently published by Benavides and collaborators, uh, where um, I think these are um, TNG 50 simulations. So they, they did select the galaxies that look like UDGs from the simulations, and they found that all of these galaxies are, or almost all of them, as you hopefully can see from the bottom plot, uh, are in the densest part of the um, of, of the structures within their simulations, which is exactly what we see for these galaxies in Virgo. They also found that these are sort of backsplash orbit galaxies. So they're, they're galaxies that come in towards the cluster and as they approach pericenter, they really lose all of their gas. You can see the time sequence in the middle panel. And, uh, and, and what you're left with is a galaxy that is very low surface brightness and essentially is, is not, no longer star forming. Okay, so um, these are the points to take away for the uh, UDGs. Um, uh, so it, it, these are not, they do not form a completely separate uh, class from the regular, uh, uh, you know, from the normal galaxy population, let's say. However, as a whole, they do display a variety of properties, including their matter content, other cluster properties, morphological appearance. They really point to a very complex uh, uh, formation and evolutionary uh, scenario. And then detailed investigation of these two particular objects, and we hope to be able to do more uh, as we move along, really suggests that these might be backsplash uh, objects that have undergone a passage through the uh, core of Virgo uh, quite recently. Okay, so um, I just realized my timer is not working, so I don't know uh, uh, what the time is. Um, oh, okay. uh, so I'll go very quickly. And uh, just a couple of words about uh, compact ellipticals, uh, which are now on the other side of the galaxy sequence. This is work that was done now a few years back uh, by Adrian Peru, who was a uh, student with us. 
Um, what we have for the compact ellipticals are um, a data for eight such objects with uh, Gemini uh, with the IFU. And these are plots showing for those eight objects, velocity, uh, velocity dispersion, age, and metallicity. There's a variety of properties that are covered by these objects. For those of you who are familiar with the Atlas 3D results, um, you will recognize here some of the properties that are displayed by much brighter uh, galaxies that were targeted by the Atlas 3D uh, sample. So there's objects that are fast rotators, objects that are slow rotator, and a range of properties that for both age and metallicities. Um, now in this plot here, it's always the same, two quantities. It's effective radius on the vertical axis and mass on the horizontal axis, but they, the points are color coded according to different parameters. So let me point out that that gap that you see in the middle, that's not physical. We wanted to have a dynamical mass for these galaxies and, and this is the sample we had to blow with, uh, which is a bit of a shame, but regardless. So the top, point, the top plot, um, the points are color coded according to local density uh, and the compact elliptical side of the galaxy with the smaller radii. So that the ones that are shown these circles, they're always found in the densest regions of the cluster, very nearby, very massive companions with no exclusion. If you look at the bottom two uh, plots, the, the points are color coded according to age and according to metallicity. And in both cases, we find that the compact elliptical are older and more metal rich compared to galaxies of the same luminosity. And they're much more akin in these properties to much more massive systems. So these are again eight objects, but based on these eight objects, uh, our conclusion, at least in Virgo, is that these objects, uh, these observations are very suggestive of a tidal origin uh, for these particular um, objects. Okay, so let me now move on to the last uh, class of objects I want to talk about, and these are ultra, ultra compact dwarfs. So um, these were objects that were first discovered in, uh, in the Furnace Cluster, but again, just like UDGs are now known to exist uh, in a variety of environments, including the field, and they're literally defined as being intermediate from between the compact ellipticals and globular clusters. That's literally the definition. Um, so they are comparable in luminosity to faint dwarf elliptical galaxies. In fact, uh, the middle panel there shows a UCD in Virgo that we discovered from the NGBS. The mass of that object is several times tend to be eight to solar mass. So it's a fairly massive object. But they're much smaller, so they have sizes that are 10 to 100 times smaller in size than, uh, than dwarf elliptical galaxies, but they're larger than global clusters. Now, the origin again, this could just be the more massive, the, the high mass tail of the galaxy uh, of the global cluster luminosity function, perhaps arising through mergers of massive star clusters, or they could be the surviving stellar uh, nuclei of tidally straight uh, nucleated dwarf elliptical galaxy, or more likely a mix of, of both. Um, so let me skip this uh, just because of time, but let me just say that with the NGVS, because of the resolution of, uh, of the uh, CHG site, which is about half an arc second uh, in the I band, we can actually measure the sizes of these uh, UCDs. Uh, so, so we can really pick them up uh, very effectively. As a whole, the UCD population is really not consistent with originating exclusively from tidal strict dwarfs. So in, in this bottom panel here, you can see the luminosity function of UCDs in green, of global clusters in uh, blue, and of nuclei in magenta. And, and as you can see, um, the UCDs really track the globular cluster much more closely than as a whole, than they track uh, the, uh, the nuclei. The nuclei, by the way, are also studied uh, with, with very high completeness from the survey. So it's a, it's a really consistent data set. On, on the left hand side, that shows the color distribution. So that's G minus Z color. And uh, the global clusters are on top, and, and these are in the same magnitude range as the UDGs, uh, uh, sorry, as the UCDs. Um, classical bimodal distribution, red and blue clusters. Um, the UCDs, the color distribution is very similar to the globulars, while the nuclei have basically unimodal distribution, they're mostly red. There's very few nuclei that are actually blue. So again, the UCDs as a whole, 
resemble the properties of the globulars more than the stellar nuclei. However, um, some, and mostly this is the most massive uh, UDGs, uh, have properties that point to a clear connection with the nuclei of dwarf galaxies. So this is a sequence of UDGs. Many of them, and they're mostly the most massive ones, have very extended envelopes. Some have tidal uh, tails, as you can see from that image down there, uh, where that tail really points to BCC 1250, uh, which is a very, um, very nearby massive galaxy. Uh, in terms of distribution within the cluster, uh, the white contours here show the distribution of X-ray gas, and the color map shows the density distribution of the UCDs. Um, and as you can see, they're very centrally uh, concentrated. And in fact, they're more centrally concentrated than the galaxies themselves, uh, as just like was the case with the UDGs. And in fact, this is, this is a sequence we're now really looking at the very central part of the clusters. Um, that's the cumulative distribution as a function of distance from the density peak. Uh, the globular clusters are very centrally concentrated. And then as you move out, you first encounter UCDs without envelopes, and then UCDs with envelopes, and then finally the quote unquote normal nucleated uh, dwarf elliptical. So th this is heuristically suggestive of the scenario where dwarf ellipticals that are in radial orbit are found preferentially far out because once they get closer, they're no longer classified as dwarf elliptical having been partially stripped, but they're classified as UCDs with envelope if they get really close. They're just UCDs without envelope, and then the closest they might be the most active uh, globular clusters. Um, there's other indications that there is a connection between UCDs and stellar nuclei. For instance, there is a tight power magnitude relation. The top line is G minus D power versus uh, Z by magnitude. The gray points at the top are uh, globular clusters, the blue points are the UCDs. In the bottom, the blue points are still the UCDs, but the red are the nuclei. So you can see that they, uh, the color magnitude relation, which is followed by the UCDs in blue, does not track the globular clusters. It does track uh, the, uh, that defined by the stellar nuclei. There's also evidence of high dynamical mass to light ratio in many of these UCDs. And, uh, and this is the nail on, on, on the UCD property, so then, um, work by Anil Seth and his collaborators show that several of these objects, although not all, but several of them, maybe five so far, host a very massive, supermassive black holes with masses that range between 10 and 20% the mass of the host galaxy when the canonical value is 0.5%. Uh, so that is a clear indication that these objects must have been a lot more massive in the past unless something really strange is going on. So as a class, UCDs are not consistent with being exclusively formed from uh, the stripping of dwarf nucleated galaxies, but some of them certainly have followed that evolutionary path. So I will conclude because I'm sure I'm basically out of time with, with just two slides uh, very quickly. Uh, I was just talking about supermassive black holes and I really wanted to give some uh, a, a shout to this particular program. This is uh, led by uh, Matt Taylor, who was a postdoc at HIA until a few months ago. He's now moved to a faculty position at the University of Calgary. And uh, Matt was awarded about uh, 44, I believe, hours uh, of time in cycle one uh, with JWC. And this is to, fall, to, to try to constrain the mass of supermassive black holes in 18 contact structures in Virgo. That's the location of those structures. But these uh, range from compact ellipticals to UCDs with envelopes, uh, without envelopes, and uh, to um, um, uh, nuclear star clusters in, in brighter ellipticals. So you can see three examples of a nuclear star cluster in a dwarf galaxy. UCD with and without envelope and, and the compact elliptical. Uh, it's not a complete sample, obviously, of these objects, but it's a representative sample. And given this, this connection uh, that, that can link these objects, I think it's going to be very interesting uh, to see what those black hole masses turn out to be. We're, we're going to be sensitive, and this is with near spec, all the way to 10 to the uh, 5 and 5 stellar masses. It's a bit of a risky project because we might actually end up with upper limits, which by itself is, is going to be very interesting. But I'm certainly
certainly very excited about this. And I, I think the data are now scheduled for, um, for December or January um, of this year. And then really looking towards the, the, the more distant future, um, the, the things that I'm most excited about insofar as these particular studies are concerned are, are the Roman space telescope, which I think is at this point a certainty, and the Mauna Kea spectroscopic explorer, which is not quite a certainty. Uh, but Roman, Roman will be able to resolve uh, Virgo's intracluster light into individual stars. So we will be able to measure TRGB distances to the intracluster light in Virgo and in the outer regions of galaxies. We will be able to do this for UDP, and which is going to be tremendous. Uh, there is a paper by uh, Bob Abram and Pat uh, okay, a few years ago where they actually calculated what it would take to do this. And it's about 54,000 54, seconds integration to reach too many to fainter than the TRGB. And they have a whole calculation in there. So not an insignificant amount of time, of course, but doable, not over the entire cluster. The field of view of Roman is only, uh, only it's 0.28 uh, square degrees. Um, but nevertheless, it's certainly within the reach of a large program to do at least a core of Virgo. And then finally, the Mauna Kea Spectroscopic Explorer, many of you will know, is, is a proposed uh, replacement of uh, CFHT with a 11.25 um, um, meter primary observatory dedicated to uh, highly multiplex spectroscopy, so over 4,000 spectra for exposure. MSC will clean up the study of global clusters and complex structures in, uh, in Virgo. We have 80,000 global clusters in, uh, in the Virgo cluster. We will be able to measure velocity for all of this, use those uh, global clusters to measure dynamical masses for the galaxies and, and, and really build a tremendous, uh, a tremendous data set. So thank you so much. I will uh, stop there. I, I hope I didn't run too much over time and I will uh, take any questions. Thank you. Uh, questions? I had a, a question in your description of the, the UCDs. You sort of implied that you, know, you see more evidence at the high mass end for uh, the tidal origin. Do you have a sense of what the mass threshold that divides those regimes is? Oh, I don't remember, actually. Um, I can go back and look. My recollection is about 10 to the 7, but I, I should, I'll, I'll go back and tell you the exact number. <laughs> yeah. It's not a it's it's not a one. It's not a hard, yeah. Thanks so much for the talk. This is great. Um, I had a question about the ultra-reduced galaxies and their measurement. Uh, I, I, I'm not in the field, and so I'm just curious if uh, if uh, diffuse foregrounds uh, play a role in the detection of these galaxies, or if you see it in the foregrounds becoming. More of a challenge, yes. In some in some cases, yes. I, I think uh, especially when you look at intracluster light or, or, or things of that nature. So sometimes, yes, yes, there is some confusion uh, for these objects because they are, um, you know, because of their morphology. Um, I, I think it's unlikely that they, that there will be very much a lot of confusion. Um, so so I tend to think that that. We have a very clean sample of them. Also, the fact that obviously they, they end up being on the scaling relations, right? They were not designed to be there. I think that's another indication. But, but it is something to be aware of. Other questions? Is there any questions in the chat? Room? No. I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. Might be naive, but why are the globular clusters so centrally concentrated? Well, it, it's uh, they basically track the dark matter uh, potential. So many of them are associated with, uh, yeah. So I, I don't think I said that, but that that is a again the, the central region of Virgo. So they're mostly associated with the galaxies themselves. So, so um, M87 is right in the darkest part of that of that thing. So what you're looking at mostly is global clusters that are associated with the, with global cluster system that are associated with the galaxies themselves. There is a more diffuse component which really permeates the entire uh, area within uh, within Virgo, but it's very low uh, low density. Let's say. You showed the globular clusters are more centrally concentrated than the galaxies. Yeah. So I don't understand. 
Oh, it, it's because they're mostly associated with the single galaxy. So, so that, that is M87 there, right? So the, the galaxies themselves might be satellites of M87 or galaxies that are in the, in the core of Virgo, but they're not um, um, gravitationally associated with M87 itself where the clusters are. So, right, so it, it's, um, so I think, I think that, that makes some amount of sense. Um, the, what is not obvious is that the UCDs should be more centrally concentrated, right? Any questions? And another question which uh, you, you alluded to for the, the measurements of the, the gas rich UDGs, but I guess I was more generally wondering how much you've been thinking about, you know, how much can we generalize some of these conclusions to the field populations? I really don't have a good answer to that. I, I, I really think you have to go into it. Right? <laughs> so, you know, the, the Virgo is, is, is a great environment um, also because there's a range of densities from the center of the cluster all the way out to, to one meter radius. So it would be great to go even further, but it is a cluster environment, right? no matter what. So, um, so really having that comparison with the field that would, would be terrific. It's hard because, you know, one advantage of doing the classes and everything is at the same distance and that really simplifies things tremendously when you start looking at the field and then you have to you, know, you have a lot of other selection effects but someone is going to have to do it <laughs> okay and, and most of our galaxies I, I i think it was fairly obvious but um they are old stellar populations so we have yeah. very few galaxies that start forming so none of the UCDs there's a couple maybe mm -hmm. that that have a, um, a partial H alpha detection mm -hmm. but um, actually maybe more than a couple but um, but mostly mostly they're they're quenched yeah all right um, well, there's no further questions we'll uh you should feel free to, to grab our her sign up sheet for meetings is up and I've sent it around. So you can feel free to, to sign up for meetings tomorrow or look like you had a couple slots Friday morning before you have to take Oh, you no, know, I leave too early on Friday. Okay, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll remove the slots on Friday morning. If you did sign up for Friday morning, it's possible to move yourself to, to Thursday. Um, uh, uh, we, we won't have our reception after because of unfortunately the, the schedule conflicts meant the timing for the dinner. Uh, so those of you who are, are joining the dinner can meet down here in a little bit, but if you want to just uh, grab more now, you can do so. And let's thank you one more time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.